it's a really, really good and very detailed chapter on this. But uh, this is how it plays out, okay? Um, and we're going to look at long term and short term, and that's generally how the, the essay questions are going to fall. It's, when we look at the long term consequences, you can see <laughs> that there is stuff that's taking place in the 1770s that will ultimately contribute to the outbreak of World War I. Um, something was going to happen, and we've been looking at you know, this, this thing for a while, uh, at least in terms of Russia. Um, and that's going to be one of the first things. These are the big factors, the factors contributing to the outbreak of this war. The reason why this is a big deal is because there has never been a war before or since that is going to be as devastating or as transformative as what World War I was. Uh, it was, for its time, the, the most devastating thing that human history has ever produced. Um, and when you put something like that together, where literally you, our course is, has broken up really into three pieces. And the two catalysts for those three pieces are the Thirty Years' War. You guys remember that one? I told you that there were dramatic impacts of what Westphalia was. That the world that existed before Westphalia was gone. And the world that existed after Westphalia um, is really the thing that kind of marches us into modern times. World War I kind of has that impact. Where the world just is not the same after World War I. Uh, so that's why it's kind of a big deal and we're going to look at it and look at things that you already know like war on the Western Front and, and all of those things. But here are essentially the, the factors that contribute to the outbreak of World War I. The first one, and we're going to spend a little bit of time on this at the beginning, is Russian 19th century foreign policy ambitions. And does anybody remember what that is? Get to the Mediterranean get to the Eastern Mediterranean. They want access to warm water ports. They want access to the Turkish Straits. The Ottoman Empire controls those Turkish Straits. The Balkans is really the key to the kingdom as far as Russia is concerned. You need to be familiar with that. And that's a story that's been playing out really since Catherine the Great. The second is called the Tale of Two Germanies. Okay. And the way that this is going to look is from 1871 to 1890 is one Germany. And that's called Bismarckian Germany. From 1890 to 1914 is a second Germany, and that is Wilhelmian Germany, or Bonehead Germany. We'll talk about that. Imperialistic rivalry is obviously a very big, big feature in this. This is the age of imperialism, and some of the contests that are going on between the major powers which, in order to play that imperialistic rivalry well, you're going to be building up your military, you're going to be building up your navy, you're going to be building up your international influence, you're going to be building up your economies. And that contest itself more or less parlays into World War I. Entangling alliance, or entangling alliances, and this is we're literally where they chose teams. The, the, the Europeans chose teams before the war even came out. And that was the Triple Entente and the Triple um, Alliance. And that pretty much says that you know they're moving towards war. They just need a reason, and obviously they'll get their reason. Rising militarism, and this is particularly evident in Britain and Germany, that they kind of take on almost what the U.S. and the Soviets were in the 1950s and 60s, where they're constantly committing more and more of their governmental funds. Uh, to building up their arsenals, particularly naval arsenals. Competitive nationalism, remember, very, very dangerous form of nationalism because it's us compared to them. All right, it's not just cultural, like, hey, we're Serb, or B, we need to become Serbia. Then it's, you know, Serbia versus other things, or Germany versus France, or Russia versus Britain or whatever it happens to be. But when you start to get to that last stage of nationalism where my livelihood or my status in the world uh, is dependent on our ability to exercise our supremacy over something else, that's a very dangerous concoction. This one is ultimately, and I put it in bold because this is the thing that really triggers it, it's rising Balkan nationalism caught between two multinational empires. And which of those two multinational empires are we talking about? The Ottoman Empire is one, 
Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary, or the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, effective diplomacy, really characterized by Bismarck, who seemed almost an altruist, if you can believe that, um, is replaced by provocative diplomacy, where it's almost like they're kind of needling each other, or they're like sticking in, uh, a stick in each other's ribs to see what, what will, will take place. It's almost like diplomacy is based on like calmer heads looking at the bigger picture. And instead what you got is a lot of, you know, kind of firebrands that are willing to roll the dice. War as the ultimate domestic political diversion. I've mentioned uh, foreign policy as an instrument for domestic political diversion. What does that mean? Alex, what does that mean? Domestic political diversion. Why would war be the ultimate domestic political diversion? Um, what is that about? Well, the, the, it's like distracting people from like the problems at home with like bigger problems. Precisely. Like war would be Rally around the flag is another way to describe it. But war itself will take our social democrats and our radicals and our anarchists and our you know, angry women because they don't have the right to vote, our subject nationalities who might be pining for independence or home rule, and we'll bring them all together because, you know, we we got to be concerned about the Kaiser right now. We can't be concerned about that. Or we got to be concerned about the French and the Belgians right now because we can't worry about that. The Russians probably need this concoction more than anybody. Okay? Mother Russia! which is, I saw in a commercial this morning, that's probably one. You know those commercials where, like, you're not yourself, and then, the like, Snickers Robert, one. then Robin Williams is like a football coach, <laughs> and then he's like a Snickers bar, and then all of a sudden he's not Robin Williams anymore? Okay, um, so let's start with the first one. Um, and we're going to look at a couple of maps as we go through so that you guys can kind of see the picture, but... Um, we're going to put all of these little things together and then hopefully you'll understand why the war started. The first one is Russian 19th century foreign policy ambitions and what I call it is coyote style on um, the crumbling Ottoman Empire. The Russians more than anybody else was looking to take advantage of the fact that the Ottoman Empire of the early 19th century or the late 18th century was not the Ottoman Empire of the 16th century. All right. And they were looking to take advantage of that weakness or the inability of the Ottomans to kind of modernize and deal with themselves internally. Their purpose, access to the Turkish Straits and a warm water port. Okay. It starts in a war between Catherine's Russia and the Turks from the 1770s. And this was part of a long string of wars that the Russians had started really during the days of Ivan III. Um, that were ultimately looking to expand further south, getting closer to the Black Sea. And they've had acquisitions really throughout the course of that time. Um, the treaty that was ultimately signed is called Kuchuk Kanarka, which is sometimes spelled K-A-Y-N-A-R-C-A, -A -A. sometimes it's spelled K-A-I-N-A-R-J-I. -A uh, but this was a treaty that was completed in 1774. All right. And Catherine was able to secure from the Turks land in the carcasses, but more importantly than anything else, they now got influence in the Holy Land. The right to protect, exclusive right to protect Orthodox Christians, um, you know, in the regions like Jerusalem and Syria, like the old, you know, Crusades, you know, areas. Um, the British response is not happy, but what is the British? Or what are the British doing in 1774? American Revolution. Yeah, they're dealing with things. They got other stuff on their plate, which is probably why they didn't raise a bigger fuss about this concession, because the British, remember, are looking the Eastern Mediterranean as their sphere of influence, um, and they are certainly trying to deny the Russians from intruding upon their sphere of influence. He says, not happy, but response put on hiatus because of the American Revolution, and then, right after that, the French Revolution, and then the Napoleonic stuff. Okay? But, this is what's taking place within the Ottoman Empire, and it's the Balkans, you know, among other things, that are starting to get nationalism. And they're starting looking uh, to assert their independence, which would ultimately come at the expense of the Ottoman Empire. Montenegro was the first to secure its independence 
and that, or its autonomy, and that was in 1799. Then Serbia was able to do it around the time of the Congress of Vienna, that was 1850, or 15. Then the war for Greek independence, you guys remember talking about that, and how Greek independence from the Ottomans kind of served as a backdrop to the first sort of battle between the British and the Russians. The Russians immediately come to the Greeks' aid, and then the British and French ultimately join in for the Greeks' aid, more or less because they were concerned that the Russians would gain way too much if the Greeks were successful in their independence. That led to two separate treaties, one was called Adrianople, where Moldavia and Wallachia, which are present-day Romania, fall under Russian protection. Russia got some rights along the Black Sea. The French and British are concerned, and then there's another treaty that's signed called London, where all the signatories recognize Greek independence, and that once Greeks get independence and name their own king, they are a sovereign power, which means that the Russians cannot utilize them as some kind of subject which then effectively keeps the Russians away from the warm water ports. The next thing that happens was that battle between Mahameh Ali and Mahmoud Deuce, and that was in 1833. Muhammad Ali or Mahameh Ali was an Egyptian um, who was looking to gain even more control, direct political control for Egypt, but also to expand Egypt's sphere of influence in its own region and they believed that the time was ripe for them to be able to kind of take it to the Ottomans directly. And that took place in the 1830s. Russia, who used to fight the Ottomans, and in fact their whole history is based on fighting the Ottomans, now agrees diplomatically to support the Ottomans to prevent the Egyptians from invading the Ottoman Empire. And then they, it leads to a treaty called Unkiar Skelesi. If that's signed, then the Ottoman Empire falls under Russian protectorship. And then the Russians jackpot. They got exactly what they want. The British kind of cable the Ottomans and, and then cable the Russians and say, if that treaty goes into effect, expect our warships in the next couple of days. And the Russians were pissed. They're like, no, oh, come on. And I think Nicholas's response was, why don't we just carve them up? They're the, the sick man of Europe. You know, why do we got to keep them on a respirator? We might as well just divide them. And then Britain looks at them and is like, oh, yeah, like you did Poland. And Russia's like, that was a low blow. <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately, that was the plan. You know, they're, they're divided, they're weak. Why don't we, why don't we just divide them up and, and, and split it? And the British are like, well, you know what? I think we'll just keep the Ottomans uh, intact in territorial sovereign. Um, because... Frankly, we're scared of you guys gaining too much influence here. And if we get scared, that means that we shoot you. And we don't really want to shoot you because we kind of liked all that fun lovingness that was at Congress of Vienna, Concert of Europe, you know, and all that crap. Uh, so that would end all of that harmony. Um, so let's just keep the harmony. We'll keep the Ottomans, therefore we keep the harmony. And the Russians are like, so they're mad. Um, France and Britain agree that the Ottomans are preserved for the purposes of maintaining the balance of power. Finally, in the 1850s, they get it on. Britain versus Russia, toe-to-toe. Uh, -to -toe. And what started to remember was that Napoleon was given concessions uh, to protect Roman Catholics in the Holy Land, and Russia got bent out of shape because they were the ones that were protecting Christians. So literally, this Crimean War started over who gets to protect Christians. Think about that. Um, Russia's response to the fact that the Ottomans had granted this concession to, the Napole to Napoleon, Louis Bonaparte, uh, was to occupy the territories that had gotten semi-autonomy, Moldavia and Wallachia. And the British and French looked and saw that and said, wait, you know, this, is, uh, this is an act of war, this is an act of aggression. And it was an excuse, but they were like, we've got to teach Russia a lesson, or they're going to constantly do stuff like this. So they attacked. And eventually the war plays out in the Crimea, specifically in the region. Crimea, if you guys haven't been paying attention, has been in the news a lot the last five or six days. All right, so you should know exactly where it is. Um, the Crimea was a strategic area as far as Russia was concerned, and as long as they maintained a stronghold in the Crimea, then their ships had a place to coal and to dock, and could then influence the Black Sea and everything else. So eventually, one of the main ports called Sevastopol 
is where the British, you know, if they can wrestle that from the Russians, then it's pretty much a done deal. And it took a while, and there was some very famous things that took place there, but eventually the British are going to succeed. And why did the British succeed? Because they've got the best army, an industrialized army. Didn't need the army. They had the Navy. And the British Navy is the biggest, baddest thing on the planet in the middle of the 19th century. And Russia doesn't really have a Navy. If they do, it's nothing compared to what the British can, can put down on them. Uh, yeah, the, I mean, the British had troops, but a lot of it was the softening uh, of those port cities because of British bombardment. And eventually they win. And remember the French helped, and then the Sardinia Piedmontese helped too. Um, Paris they lose access to the Black Sea. And that gets them further and further and further from their goal of realizing the Turkish Straits or realizing control of the Turkish Straits. So now they go back to the drawing board. Remember, internally for Russia, that's where they got exposed. We call them pants dropping moments. Their pants got dropped. And they said, you know what, we can't be this ill-equipped to deal with a Western power's influence again we got to modernize, and that's when Alexander II started the so-called Great Reforms. Lessons learned for Russia, look at internal reform, develop a new strategy for Turkish Straits. And they said, wait, we've got one. And it comes in the latter portion of the 19th century that the Russians decide that they are Slavic people, and that all of the Balkans are full of Slavic people and that the Slavic people want their independence from the Ottoman Empire and the Russians will help them get it because after all they are Slavic big brother. That's what Russia's new label is going to be. We and the Slavs, they're family man, they're blood. We're going to help them. Bulgarians, Slovenians, Serbs, Croats, whatever the hell, they're, they're our people. And so if they're just fighting for freedom, then by, by golly, we as their brothers are going to help them with that freedom. Well, A, that's not true. They're not Slavs. The Russians were not Slavic people. They were Finno-Ergic. Their founder was a freaking Viking. Okay? His name was Rurik. Um, but it works. Okay? And now all of these like Balkan people are looking, looking to Russia and saying, hey, thanks, man. We never had a big brother before. This is cool. The Russians are like, think nothing of it. I promise you that our motives are completely altruistic. We just want to help a fellow brother. Does everybody understand that that's not true? Yeah. Good. Okay, so meet Big, blo big Brother. Patriarchal caretaker to Balkan Pan-Slavism. The purpose, the reality, the reality is, is that we will use this as our leverage to gain control, finally, to the Turkish Straits. So, here's what we got so far. Pre-World War I, Russia and Britain are playing an across-the-globe power politics game. Britain checks Russian warm water ambitions in the eastern Mediterranean. Britain checks Russian warm water ambitions in the Persian Gulf. I mentioned that before the break, the great game with Afghanistan and Persia. And in the Pacific, later on, the British will ultimately sign a pact with the Japanese because the Japanese have written, risen up as the Pacific power and if the British have diplomacy with Japan, Japan can check Russia. They don't need Britain to check Russia in the Pacific. We got Japan to do that. Okay? But for our discussion, it's going to be about the Turkish Straits. All right? All right, so number two, the tale of two Germanys. And we're going to look at kind of how this plays out. Bismarck is... And really what we're looking at first is like we're snapshotting and looking at each country in 1871. Okay? And you look down here, this is from Vialt. If you guys have your Vialt books, you can kind of read along on this. But here are the seven major players in World War I. The seven big states that are ultimately going to be the feature. All right? And what I want you to write down is, what does each of these guys want? If you are Austria-Hungary, and it is 1871, what do you want? Katie, you're Austria-Hungary, it's 1871, what do you want? Let's think about it. They just became Austria-Hungary, right? 
They're weak and vulnerable. They had to surrender to the Hungarians' virtual independence. Okay? What makes them the most vulnerable? Nationalism. Nationalism. So honestly, if you were Austria-Hungary, what is it that you want? You want to survive. Okay? You want to maintain at least your your role in political affairs. The Balkans scares the crap out of you. So ultimately, you're looking for uh, partners. You're looking for supporters. You're looking for treaties. You're looking for alliances. You need something that will keep you safe and make you comfortable uh, in this changing landscape known as Balkan nationalism. Okay. Um, Natalie. You are Serbia. It's 1871. What is it that you want? <laughs> Serbia is in the Balkans. Oh, okay. They want. If that helps. Oh, that does help. They want. <laughs> they want. Well, let's take a look. <laughs> All right. That's what the map looks like. Here's Austria-Hungary. Here's Romania. Here's Bulgaria. Here's Serbia. This is their region, all that stuff in color that you see is the so-called Balkans, all right? Uh, with the exception of Hungary. Mm -hmm. What do they want? They want their independence, right? They got it, they've had it. They want safety. They want more. They want more than safety? They want more. The they Serbs are the ones that pretty much start <laughs> this fight. They want what do they want? A lot. They want to butcher every last Turk there is in the region. Uh, I don't know how much Turks they want to butcher. I don't think that they, they see the Turks as an enemy, sure. But they also see somebody else as a much bigger enemy. Who is it? Austria. That's right. It is Austria. Do you know why? Because there's somewhere between one and a half and two million Slavic people in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And what is Serbia's ultimate ambition? Don't say independence. They already got it. What would be the next gen thing? What would be the next stage? Ultra nationalism. They want to unite all of the Serbs together in one gigantic Serbia or Slavia. A large Slavia. A Yugoslavia, if you will. <laughs> they want to bring all the Serbs together under one country. They want to rescue them from their bondage and some of these other multinational empires. So the Serbs see the Slavs as their brothers too. And that puts the Serbs and the Russians kind of in bed together because both of them want the same thing, <coughs> supposedly. All right, let's look back here. Chris? Yes. If you don't get this one right, I don't know what I can say. What is it that Russia wants in 1871? Um, land. Specifically where? Specifically, Balkans to get the Turkey to get. Um, yes, they the want Turkey. the warm water port, yes. and that's what they've always wanted. It's like that freaking kid from a Christmas story that wanted the 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 BB gun, right? You guys have seen that movie before. Christmas Whatever it was called, they had the you know the thing that keeps time right in the stock. A Christmas. The you Christmas ever seen the Christmas story with that little kid? He just wants the BB gun. <laughs> the whole freaking movie is about the kid getting the BB gun. <laughs> Russia wants the BB gun. Okay. How about Great Britain? What do they want? Kyle, you're Great Britain. What do you want? Russia and not to get the Balkans. Yeah. I mean, Britain's, remember, there's three things that I told you that if you screw with these things, you will interest Britain. What are they? Trade, Navy. Trade. Trade. Colonies. Commerce. Yeah. Colonies. If you don't deal with those things in continental Europe, Britain is disinterested. They're isolationists for all practical purposes. Their, their thing is Navy, Colonies, Commerce. If you mess with those things, they get interested. Do you think that the Serbs being upset at the Austro-Hungarians interest the British in the least? No. But Russia getting access to the Turkish Straits interests Britain a great deal. Because that's part of their wheelhouse. That's part of their trifecta. You don't mess with the trifecta. Jake, this is a little bit tougher, but what does France want? Uh, it's a French word and it starts with R. What just happened to the French in 1871? They were, uh, they had another change of republic. 
But before that, we're talking about foreign policy. Okay. Uh, the French. Yeah. Okay. They were humiliated. They were destroyed by who? Germany. The Germans. Oh, right. The Treaty of Frankfurt. Remember, they had their victory celebrations in Paris. They right. signed. They signed their their the treaty at Versailles. They crowned their emperor in Versailles. They took Alsace and Lorraine away from them. They humiliated. Them. What does France want? Revenge. Revenge. In French, it is way Bosch. <laughs> right. Germany. Bismarck's Germany. What does Germany want? Unite. Nothing. What they want is for everybody else to chill out. They want peace and they want to keep France isolated because France is the only one that's really pissed at them. Little Brother. That's the nickname that we give Italy. Okay. The reason why I call them Little Brother is if you ever see the old cartoons where you have like the little dog that follows the big dog. So it's like, where are we going, George? Where are we going, George? Where are we going? So I kind of jumping on, like, shut up, you know? Little Italy is a very, very kind of new to the game type of thing. They're not really strong enough. They're not really among the great powers of Europe, but they think they are. All right? So if there's diplomacy to be had, Italy just wants to have a seat at the table. If there's colonies to be had, Italy wants some. If there's an alliance to be signed, Italy wants to be in it. All right, they want to be invited to the cool parties. They want to hang with P. Diddy. And right now, P. Diddy is Otto von Bismarck. Okay? Does everybody know who P. Diddy is? I think his name is Puff Daddy. Or Sean Combs. He's the guy that kept doing the voiceovers on all of Biggie Small's work. In other words, like, shut up. Just let B Biggie rap. We don't need you to go yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's go back. All right. Clearly, the most dominant diplomatic political figure on the planet in 1871 to 1890 is Otto von Bismarck. That dude is the man. All right. He is the center of the diplomatic universe. He's like what Louis was in his time. His main goals are a no individual ambitions. As far as he's concerned, Germany is united. He is powerful. They are the biggest barking his dog in continental Europe, uh, and he's good with that, all right? He possessed the most powerful state in continental Europe. He had no global political ambitions. He only wanted to keep peace, which was very delicate to do, and keep his one enemy diplomatically isolated. Make sure France has no friends. That's what Bismarck is trying to accomplish. The first thing he does towards that accomplishment is called Dreckheiserbund which means three emperors league that Germany offers to bring Austria-Hungary, Russia, and Germany together. Okay, it's like a, a revisit of the Holy Alliance of the old days. And the Wonder Twins, they're, they're all empires. You know, Caesar, they got czars, they got kaisers, they got emperors, Franz Joseph, uh, Wilhelm I, at the time, Tsar Alexander II. Uh, it's an alliance of old school conservatives, and it's a shrewd political move because Bismarck's already playing the next play, the Balkans. Remember, for Russia's just announced itself as Slavic big brother, Austria-Hungary is most vulnerable to Slavic nationalism. So automatically it puts Austria-Hungary and Russia in a potential matchup, and he's already thinking about it, and that's why he brings them together into an alliance. Okay? Where Germany's like, no, 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 you guys are hanging with me today. You know? Oh, dude, we gotta go, man. We gotta go, no, 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 stay. All right? Bismarck's gonna keep his boys here with him. Because if they go fighting each other, then Bismarck's gonna have to make a choice. And he doesn't wanna make that choice. Because you know what? If he chooses one over the other, then the other, where are they gonna go? France. Because France is, might be having a kick ass party, and they might wanna be part of that party. But Bismarck's like, no, 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 this is the party right here. Stay right here. Okay? All right. Back to Russia. And this is literally World War I. Okay? What's going to happen is there's going to be something that happens in the Balkans, followed by something stupid that Germany does, followed by back to the Balkans, followed by something stupid Germany does, followed by back to the Balkans. 
All right, that's really what's going to happen after this. But we have to get rid of Bismarck before all this stupid Germany stuff happens. All right. So number one, back to Russia. All right, Slavic Big Brother moves in. It's called the Russo-Turkish War, and basically this is the Balkans. The Balkans now is in this vibe that they want to break free of the Ottoman Empire and they want to craft their own identity. And so a bunch of Balkan powers get together and the idea is to free Bulgaria from Ottoman control. All right? Russia's like, hey, what are you guys up to? Oh, man, well, we're slobs and we're tired of being under Ottoman control, so we're going to fight them. Russia's like, we'd love to help. Why? <coughs> well, because we're brothers. Cool, that's fine. Russia fights the Turks. How's that going to go for the Turks? How's that going to go for the Ottoman Empire? Pretty bad as usual? Yeah, pretty bad. All right. The Russians are going to beat them down. The Bulgarians and the Serbs and everybody else are like high-fiving each other, joy to the world type of stuff. Because Russia's delivered on a promise to support them in their efforts, and they've got a big victory here. Here's what it says in Vial. In 1876, that Midat Pasha revolt started, right? Remember when I told you there was some internal stuff that was going on with the Ottoman Empire? Um, and a massive uprising on the heels of that breaks out in Bulgaria. In suppressing the Bulgarian revolt, the Turks slaughtered thousands. The two small autonomous Balkan states of Serbia and Montenegro responded by declaring war on the Ottoman Empire. The Russians asserted their self-proclaimed role as protectors of the Slavs and Orthodox Christians going to war against Turkey in 1877, and then they signed a treaty called San Stefano. Okay? The Russians forced the Turks to accept the San Stefano Treaty in March of 1878. The treaty established the independence of Tur Serbia, Montenegro, and Romania, and granted autonomy to a large Bulgaria, including most of Macedonia, with access to the Aegean Sea. Bulgaria would be under Russian domination. The treaty awarded Batum and Kars and other Turkish lands in the Caucasus to Russia. Remember where we're at. Okay? I don't know if this... This might be a map. Let's see. Oh, yeah, there it is. All right. This is the reason that I had the map. Okay? So this is what would have happened with San Stefano. Okay? Um, let me kind of explain how this goes now. Um, can everybody see this? Yep, our camera can see. So, okay, so here's Romania. Remember, that was Moldavia and Wallachia. Here's Serbia. This is Bulgaria that tried to rise up in a revolt. The Turks came in and supposedly slaughtered a bunch of people. And then the Russians came in with the Serbs and Montenegrins and said, you know, that's it. We're going to war against the Turks. The Treaty of San Stefano, then, like I said, he gave a bunch of lands to the Russians in the Caucasus, which is not a big deal. But the Bulgarian boundary, the original one that they had conceptualized, was going to go all the way down here to the Aegean Sea. Okay? That's bad. Because if it did, and especially if Bulgaria would have become protectorship of the Russians, that means that this boundary of Bulgaria goes right to the sea. And what do the British do? And what do the Austro-Hungarians do when, they, when all this stuff starts to go down? They, they're like, no, 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 wait. And Britain's like, yeah, if that happens, we're going to war. Because you guys are in the Straits, and we told you to stay out of the Straits. So you better do something diplomatically to solve for this, or there's going to be hell to pay. Right? So Bismarck's like, hey, hey, everybody relax. Everybody relax. Come, sit down, meet at Berlin. Everybody grab a beer, sit down. We're going to chill this thing out. We'll figure it out. And the Austro-Hungarians and the British are like, you better find something to go on with this. And the Russians are like, what's the problem? And the Bulgarians are like, what's the problem? And Serbia's like, this is good. And Bismarck finally looks at the Austro-Hungarians and the British and says, uh, what do we need to do uh, to kind of chill this thing out? And the British were like, well, if uh, the boundary of Bulgaria extends to the sea and the Russians have protectorship rights over Bulgaria, then therein lies a problem. So you might have to modify that boundary. And the Austro-Hungarians are like, the Russians just got gigantic influence in the Balkans. The Balkans itself is like, like seven guns like trained at us. So we need to feel safer. 
So Bismarck's like, okay, here's what we'll here's what we'll do. Um, we're going to drop the boundary of Bulgaria to here. So you literally chopped off like 60% of Bulgaria. Then you created a semi-autonomous province called Eastern Romelia. And all of this stuff ended up getting retained by the Ottoman Empire. So now Ottoman Empire sovereignty stretches all across the Turkish Straits. Everybody see? How happy is uh, Serbia? How happy is Bulgaria? How happy is Russia? How happy is Serbia looking at Russia and saying, I thought you were big brother. How did you let that happen? And the Russians are like, what can we do? Do you want us to go to war with Germany, Austria, Hungary, and uh, Britain? No. Sorry. Not for you guys. So they back off. And this is an embarrassment for Russia who has taken on this role of Slavic big brother. The Serbs are pissed. And they're going to be even more pissed because this is the one thing that I didn't tell you before. Sorry. I'm trying to get to the other maps. Here's another thing that happened that nobody really talked about. Is this little area here. Bosnia, Herzegovina is almost entirely Slavs. And the Austrians were given protectorship rights over it at the Congress of Berlin in 1878. That was their compensation for Russia gaining lands in the Caucasus so that there was like a tit for tat and balance of power would be maintained. The Serbs were like, what? Bosnia is going to the Austro-Hungarians? The Bosnians, that whole area is full of Slavs. So now you're adding more Slavs to Austria. This is important. What is the capital of Bosnia Herzegovina? Sarajevo. Hmm. Okay. Save that for a second. All right. Moving on. Well, that's the map that kind of shows you how it played out. Okay. Liberated Bulgaria. So that's the Bul that's the Bulgaria that they settled on. The one that is in the more pukey looking green. Actually, that's the more seaweed looking green. That's definitely the pukey green. All right, so how does the Balkan situation and the two treaties screw up Bismarck's alliance system? How is it that the Kaiserbund is going to be able to survive what just went down in the Balkans? Russia is proclaiming itself to be the big brother to Slavic nationalism. And the Austro-Hungarians are threatened so much by Slavic nationalism that they don't know what to do. And how are we going to stay in an alliance together when the Serbs are going, hmm, hey Russia, you're Slavic big brother, right? And of course we are. Of course we are. Um, why are you in an alliance with Austria-Hungary? That's interesting. So Russia cannot be friends with Austria-Hungary. And that Drakaiserbund doesn't make sense anymore by 1878. Bismarck's on. Here's what he does. First thing is, is that he shores up a military alliance with Austria-Hungary. Why? Because Austria-Hungary is vulnerable. Okay? Austria is vulnerable, and he sees that. It's like, an alliance means that if you attack Austria-Hungary, you attack Germany. And he feels like, as long as I can shore up that alliance, we're good. Austria-Hungary doesn't feel threatened. And then little, little, little Italy, little brother, is like, oh, are you guys making alliances? Bismarck's like, yeah. Could we be in it? I guess. Yeah, that's fine. So the Triple Alliance forms, which has Italy, Austria, Hungary, and Germany. But he still hasn't solved matters with Russia. And re remember, Russia is now kind of in this, like, what the hell's going on kind of state, because uh, Germany is now in a formidable, like, military alliance with Austria, Hungary. But Bismarck's like, if I don't do something soon, Russia's going to start hanging around and sniffing and saying, maybe if France wants to be friends. So Bismarck immediately goes to Russia and says, all right, I get it. I get that the Drakaiser bone's not going to work. Uh, this is what Drakaiser bone looked like. So you got a triangle, really. Okay? And here's Germany, and here's Russia, and here's Austria-Hungary. Okay? And it's all together, and everybody's pals, and we're all emperors and all of that. 
But these two can no longer be pals. They cannot be implicated like in an alliance together because Russia has to answer to Serbia, right? And Austria and Hungary is an enemy of Serbia. And he knows that. Bismarck's like, okay, so here's what we'll do. Um, we're going to sign a treaty. And I promise that I will support Russia in every way, diplomatically, economically, whatever. You and I are friends unless you attack Austria-Hungary. If you attack Austria-Hungary, then our relationship is off. And Russia's like, okay, that's cool. Because it's good to have somebody like Germany in our corner. Okay? Austria-Hungary, same deal. Austria-Hungary, you and I are in a military alliance together, and the only thing that will disrupt that is if you make any provocative attacks against Russia. Do you get it? Austria-Hungary's like, sure, we get it. It's called the reinsurance treaty. You've eliminated the triangle, but you've tied the two together in their mutual relationship with Germany, and you've taken away any concerns that the Serbs or others would have that Russia and Austria-Hungary are in some kind of communication together. That's pretty genius if you think about it, right? Now, that's really the last thing that Bismarck got to do in diplomacy. And then in 1890, he was fired. They call it dropping the pilot. All right. Wilhelm I died almost six months after that reinsurance treaty was put together. Kaiser Wilhelm comes in next. And Wilhelm has a lot of different ideas about what Germany should be in, um, in foreign policy. And he's going to switch it all up. Bismarck, remember, it was all about, hey, we've got very limited plans. You know, we are the continental European power, and we are cool with that. We're going to maintain nice relationships with everybody. We're going to keep France isolated. Wilhelm said, no, uh, I'm not satisfied with the role that we play in global affairs, and we need to be bigger than we are. We need to compete for colonies. We need to build up our navy and a whole bunch of other things. So there are five things that Wilhelm II is going to do that immediately are suggesting you're an idiot. Okay. Number one, he gets rid of the best diplomatic figure maybe that Europe has ever had. Because he personally did not want to share power with a powerful uh, prime minister. Because he said that, that Bismarck was uh, a liability because he didn't get along with the social democrats. And because Bismarck was realpolitik, whereas Wilhelm was weltpolitik. He believed Germany needed to become a world power. They needed to compete with the Frances and the Britons and the U.S.'s of the world for uh, markets and colonies and, and influence. Okay. Second thing was that he lets the reinsurance treaty lapse. He lets he doesn't renew it. And that's in 1890. He's like, look, I don't think that we can be true to both Austria, Hungary, and Russia. We've got more in common with Austria, Hungary. Most of them are German-speaking people. Uh, so the hell with the reinsurance treaty. He says logistically it doesn't make sense. The third thing is that after he reads Alfred T. Mahan's The Influence of Sea Power in History, Teddy Roosevelt also read that, and it led both of them to start constructing massive navies. All right? It led Wilhelm and Defense Minister Helmut von Moltke uh, to create a powerful navy that would be able to compete with the British for global naval supremacy. Okay? Weltpolitik replaces realpolitik. Germany will now challenge the one country that they should not challenge and drags their only real competition out of splendid isolationism. Britain was totally unaffected by what happened in continental Europe. I told you guys that. All right? And he does the one thing that you needed to do to start getting Britain concerned. Because he's saying Germany is going to mess with commerce, colonies, and navy. And now the, the British are looking around and like, what the? Bismarck was cool. He never challenged us on any of that stuff. He says, you have a sphere of influence, we have a sphere of influence, we can get along in the world famously. And they had really, Prussia and Britain had been interlinked since the diplomatic agreements of the 1750s. And in, one, in two years, he's going to screw that up. Okay? Second thing is, when he refuses to renew the reinsurance treaty, guess what happens to Russia? They're isolated. Guess who else is isolated? 
Trains. Guess how long it took for the two of them to hammer out an agreement? About a year. Okay. Colonialism and imperialism. Germany starts showing up in Africa. Germany starts showing up in Asia. Germany starts showing up in China. You think that the British are a little more concerned? What he's effectively done is he's changed the entire dynamic of the way that Russia looked, or Britain looked at the world. Britain had been in a competition with Russia for the whole 19th century. And he, Germany came along at a time where the British were so concerned about what the Germans posed as a threat that they started to think the Russians weren't all that bad. Uh-oh. ruh -roh. Finance and propaganda. During the Boer War, which I don't know if any of you guys remember that, but that's when the British were fighting um, the descendants of the Dutch uh, for Orange Free State in Transvaal. And when the incident happened, where the Boer republics like rose up and revolted against the British, Wilhelm sent a congratulatory telegram to Paul Kruger, the head of the Boer republics. You know, that's that's sort of like, what are you doing? You know, why why do you have to say anything? It's almost like, hey, look what he did. You know, good for you showing those British up. And the British are like. Wilhelm, are you an idiot? Why are you doing this? Do you want to fight us? And what do you think Britain's going to do? They're, they're up to that point, they're completely isolated. They, they don't have any agreements with anybody in Europe. What he's going to do is he's going to take Britain away from that, and then Britain is going to start allying itself with everybody that's not allied with Germany. Good thinking, buddy. Good job. As a result, the walls come a tumbling down. Here's what takes place. As soon as the reinsurance treaty lapses, a Franco-Russian alliance. Italy is like, wait a second. I thought Bismarck's party was the cool party. How come France and Russia are hanging out together now? Maybe we want to hang out with France. So Italy's now lukewarm, which would suggest that the only real alliance that Germany's got left is Austria Hungary. Remember that vulnerable multinational empire that's neighboring a sea of rising Balkan nationalism? Then the Anglo Japanese Pact. The British first make their move, but it's still kind of about the Russians. They make a peaceful agreement um, that they still consider the Russians the biggest threat because of the threat that they pose to warm water or gaining access to warm water ports. It takes two more years, but eventually Britain now is going to start signing agreements with lifelong enemies. First it's the French, it's called Entente Cordiale. Then it's a Russian Entente with the British in 1907. That's right. After 140 years of Russia being the one thing that, that Britain was semi-concerned about in Europe, they are now friends with that concern. Germany has now superseded whatever problems the British had had historically with the Russians. And now you have the Triple Entente. So you have sides chosen. The war doesn't start until 1914, but the sides are chosen in 1907. Britain, France, and Russia on one team, Germany and Austria-Hungary on the other team, and Italy, whatever. Okay. So here's what happens. Boneheaded maneuvers by the bonehead. The first one is called the Moroccan Crisis. Okay. Morocco, if you don't know, is in the western, northwestern portion of Africa, and it is a really, really, it's strategically, it controls a lot of the trade that would exist in the western Mediterranean. France, since the days that it got involved in Algeria, uh, which was back in like the 1830s, has had its eye on Morocco. Germany shows up in Morocco in 1905. And France is like, what in the hell are you guys doing in Morocco? And Germany's like, why, man? We're thinking we might want to colonize Morocco. And France is like, look, everybody knows that we want to colonize Morocco. Ask anyone. And Germany's like, well, you know, I think, I think we, we, we kind of want Morocco too. So uh, what are you going to do about it? And the French are like, well, this is impossible. And then they say, we will have an agreement. And they all meet. And Germany didn't want Morocco. Wilhelm was like, I can't believe it, but France and Britain and Russia are all together. 
There's no way that anybody's going to come to France's support. Okay? There's no way Britain's going to like lay themselves on the line for France. There's no way that Russia is going to lay them. Remember the Crimean War? This this new agreement is so pathetic that there's no way that it's true. Well, they have a meeting. It's called the Al Jazeera's conference. And the gamble was that if Germany involves itself in Morocco, it will then show that France will get isolated and then their alliances will start to weaken. What happens at Al Jazeera's? France isn't isolated. Britain steps up for France. Russia steps up for France. And it just so happens that everybody else steps up for France except for Austria-Hungary. And obviously, so what? Germany already knows they have Austria-Hungary. But every other country in the international community was siding with France. And now, for the first time, Wilhelm realizes that a decade worth of bonehead has now isolated Germany. Back to the Balkan powder keg. And this one is it's almost freaking hilarious what went down. This is called the Bosnian crisis in 1908. Here's who meets in private. Austria-Hungary and Russia. Have you guys been paying attention at all? Do you know how preposterous it would be to create a scenario where Austria-Hungary and Russia are meeting behind closed doors? <laughs> this is 1908, and that's what happens. Ministers from Austria-Hungary and Russia get together, and they're kind of like, you know, hey, man, we're not friends anymore. That sucks. It's like, why? You know, why did it come to this? Remember the Kaiserbund? And remember, like, the Holy Alliance? And, you know, we've got so much in common. We have such history. Remember when, like, the Hungarians rose up? And, and like, Hungary's like, yeah, I remember when the Hungarians rose up. <laughs> yeah, remember when we came in with, like, 300,000 troops and, like, beat the crap out of you guys? Yeah, those were good times. Anyway, um, Austria-Hungary is looking at Russia, and they're like, man, we need to mend the fences here. We have too much history together. Uh, so what do we need to do? And uh, Austria-Hungary's like, well, you know, we've, we've got protectorship rights over Bosnia, but frankly, the Serbs, the way they've been acting, um, we'd feel a lot better if we had a buffer state right in that region. So we'd like to take over Bosnia and Herzegovina. And Russia's like, yeah, you know, that's, that's dope, that's cool. And what would you guys like? And Austria-Hungary's like, and so what, what can we do for you? And Russia's like, come on, man. Straight. Everybody knows that. So Austria-Hungary looks at Russia and goes, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to occupy Bosnia and Herzegovina, and you guys go and access the Turkish streets. Go and you know, occupy. And we'll just you know, call it a day. And then if we're, we're, we're together, then there's nobody's going to really start any trouble about it. And so, especially after Britain is in an, in an agreement with uh, Russia, you know, Britain's not going to turn its back on that agreement because they're more concerned about Germany now. So it's almost like Austria-Hungary are taking, and Russia are both taking advantage of the fact that Germany and, and Britain are more in this contest together now. And so, <laughs> here's what happens. Austria goes into Bosnia and Herzegovina, right? Russia starts to move towards the Straits, and Austria-Hungary is like, hey, hey, look, Russia's trying to access the Straits. Look at that. <laughs> and everybody wakes up from whatever slumber they were in, like, what the hell are you doing, Russia? And Austria's kind of laughing about it. And what is Russia supposed to do? Because Serbs is, Serbia is looking at them and going, why would you guys be trying to access the Turkish Straits? What is Russia saying? Well, you know what, uh, we were in this like backroom agreement with your sworn enemy, and we decided that we didn't really want to be Slavic Big Brother, we really just want the Straits. So they have to shut up. And Austria-Hungary gets Bosnia, Russia gets nothing, Serbia gets pissed, and Russia gets embarrassed again. Okay? That's what goes down in that powder keg. Meanwhile, back to the bonehead. Um, another Moroccan crisis, this time um, the belief is okay. So diplomatically you'll support France, but would you militarily support France? So he parks a gunboat, a German gunship, outside of the coast of Morocco called the Panther. And it's a test. It's the, we're going to move make a military maneuver to make it look like we're going to occupy Morocco and go to war with France and we want to see if the British will then send its ships to defend France. 
And what does Britain do? They send their ships to defend France, and Germany backs off. It was just a, you know, when we dangle the foot in the water, see what happens. Um, but that's what happens. France uh, cedes a, in order to kind of like save face everybody, that they ceded a portion of the French Congo to Germany, um, but then they completely backed off of Morocco. The rest of this is just Balkan powder keg, okay? The first thing that happens is that when the, that revolution takes place, the one with the young Turks, um, that Italy tries to take advantage of the fact that there's an internal revolution going on in the Ottoman Empire, and they snatch Libya. Okay? Libya was one of the North African states that the Ottomans had controlled for a long time. Now the Italians own it. And the Balkan states are looking around and like, did you see that? Italy just took a large chunk of territory from the Ottomans. Like Italy, let me repeat, Italy took it. So Bulgaria, Serbia, Montenegro, Romania, all of those countries get together and they're like, well, that's it. You know, if Italy can take anything from the Ottoman Empire, if we, we don't need Russia, we'll just take stuff from the Ottoman Empire. So they go to war against the Ottoman Empire, it's called the Balkan League. Okay? Um, they have lit the, the Balkan powder keg fuse or whatever you want to call it. So it's the Balkan League versus the Turks. Turkey is defeated, the Balkan League takes land that goes all the way to the Straits. So that's the first thing that happened. This is in 1912-1913. It's called the First Balkan War. Okay? It says Italy's easy victory over the Turks encouraged a small Balkan or those small Balkan states to press their demands against the Turks under Russian patronage, which at that time they didn't really trust that much anymore anyway. But Bulgaria, Serbia, Montenegro, and Greece had formed a Balkan League. They went to war against Turkey, and under the Treaty of London terms, the defeated Ottoman Empire lost all of the territory in Europe except for the area immediately adjacent to the Turkish Straits. As the First Balkan War drew to a close, both Austria and Russia intervened diplomatically. The Russians supported Serbia's demand for access to the Adriatic Sea, while the Austrians urged the creation of a new Balkan state called Al Albania to contain Serbia's expansion. An international conference was held. So, uh, yet again, they make the Balkans get big gains from the Ottoman Turks, but the Austrians step in and want a diplomatic agreement that will create a new thing. And this is what they ended up with. Okay? Serbia is denied. They were going to, so this is what ultimately the boundary was going to be. Serbia was going to go all the way down here, and then they were going to get all of this territory as well. And then Bulgaria was going to get a bunch of this territory here, okay? And what ended up happening was they had this diplomatic agreement, and they literally created a freaking state out of the blue, Albania. And the Serbs were looking at the Russians and going, are you freaking kidding me, Albania? Like, yeah, Albania, um, you know, ethnic Albanians, you know, got a long history. Like, they don't have any history. It's a freaking made-up place. <laughs> the only thing that you did was you created an artificial state so that Serbia doesn't have access to the Adriatic Sea. That's exactly what it was. And Russia's like, hmm? <laughs> and Serbia's like, every time we ask you to help us, big brother, you go, hmm? The Serbs were so pissed off at the Second Balkan War, the Serbs were so upset that they attacked Bulgaria. Think about that one for a second. That's like Chris and Salim getting in a gigantic fight, right? And Salim is upset because Chris like beat him down or something like that. So Salim is so upset that he goes and he punches Phyllis. <laughs> That's what that war was about. All right. Having been denied access to the Adriatic, Serbia demanded part of Bulgaria's share of Macedonia as compensation. And Bulgaria's like, what? Why are you... And, and Bulgaria's like, no! And Serbia goes to war against Bulgaria. And Serbia, Montenegro, Greece, Romania, and Turkey joined to defeat Bulgaria. The Treaty of Bucharest forced Bulgaria to cede territory to Romania while Serbia and Greece gained most of Macedonia. You, what, what you've done is you created Bulgaria as a state that is now kind of isolated by the other Balkan powers. And they ultimately kind of become friends with the Turks, and they become friends with the Germans, and they become friends with the Austro-Hungarians. Okay? 
Does anybody know what the third Balkan War is called? World War One. World War One. Yes, that's the last thing that's in the notes. Okay. The third Balkan War is when Franz Ferdinand and his wife decide to do the JFK and Jackie Dallas trip, right? They're going to go to Sarajevo and they say, you know what, Bosnia and Herzegovina, are, they're a newly acquired state by the Austrian Empire. Uh, we're going to go down there and we're going to go on like a friendly, you know, meet the new parents kind of tour, right? This is the, you know, future emperor of Austria-Hungary. Austria -Hungary. And so he and his wife come and I say, welcome to Dallas, JFK, and Jack. Um, the Serbians have built this militant, like IRA, PLO kind of organization called the Black Hand. And the Black Hand decides to go to Bosnia and hang out in Sarajevo and await, you know, become part of the welcoming committee, if you will. Um, so that's what happens. Gavrilo Princip, who is the head of this Black Hand, their motto was Union or Death. Union meaning pan-Slavism, bringing all the Slavs together. Um, so that's what happens. Um, they go to Sarajevo. The story breaks down like this. Gavrilo Princip has got a whole bunch of assassins that are kind of lined up on the parade route. Somehow, the, the, the entourage that Sophie and, um, and Ferdinand were in got mixed up on the map and ended up turning down like a detour street. And supposedly Gavrilo Princip was hanging out at like this cafe or something. <laughs> and he was, yeah, he was waiting, and he was waiting for like a, a call. He was waiting like for something to say, you know, like the, you know, the geese are in the nest or some crap, you know, some thing that said, you know, yeah, we, we clipped them, right? He doesn't get it. And then he's like looking out the window and he's, you know, eating or whatever, having his coffee. And he's like, this freaking Sophie and Ferdinand coming around the corner. And he's like, so he walks outside and shoots him. <laughs> and that's, that's how World War One starts, right? So here's how this plays out. The third, the, because that's just that's an assassination. Great, all right. How does that turn like all of the contesting European powers into a general war? That's a neat little story. But here's how it plays out. The Austrian foreign minister, his name is Berthold Leopold von Berthold, meets with Germany and says, um, "Our." Our future emperor was just assassinated. The Serbs are behind it. We know they're behind it. Uh, we're pissed. We, we we're going to do something to Serbia, and we want to know if our alliance is strong and that you will support us in whatever we do. And Bethmann Holweg, which was the name of the foreign minister in Germany, says, "Whatever you need to." They call it the blank check. We're basically we're we're signing off on whatever you decide to do. Okay. Austria then puts this ultimatum on Serbia, and it's basically like, we want all the culprits, we want you to take control of it, you have until like 3 o'clock this afternoon to meet our demands. And Serbia's like, well, wait a second, hang on, you know, you know, we can't possibly do that. And Austria's like, tough crap, time's out, we declare war on you. <laughs> Alright, and now Germany is like, I guess we're going to war against Serbia. This time Russia is, you know, like, Oh no, here comes Russia. What are you going to do this time, Russia? Because every time that Serbia needs you, you've let them down. Russia is now in a place where they're out of bullets and they've got, they've got, to, they got to act. They feel a little bit more empowered because France and Britain are kind of on their side now. So Russia starts to mobilize. And Germany sends some telegrams to Russia and say, um, why are you mobilizing? Um, we're going to go to war with us or with Serbia, and we we pretty much want you to stay out of it. And Russia's like, well, Serbia is one of our allies, and we will support them. And Germany's like, wrong answer. We declare a war on you. So now Russia's in. And then France. You have to ask that question, right? So so Germany's like to France. Uh, all right, so here's, the, here's what's happened so far. Uh, Serbia has assassinated Austria-Hungary's uh, emperor. Austria-Hungary's declared war on Serbia. Uh, Russia has mobilized in defense of Serbia. We've declared war on Russia. What are you guys going to do? And France is like, you know, we will do what we do. And they're like, what the hell does that mean? You do what you do. It's like, you heard us, we will do what we do. And so. Germany's like, wrong answer, and then they declared war on <laughs> um, 
France answers in a snobbishly standoffish matter, smoking a cigarette. Germany declares war on France. Um, they had already thought about this as early as the Entente Cordiale, or as early as the Entente between uh, France and Russia uh, in 1894. Uh, the German military command had already put together a plan of what it would be like if they had to mobilize against France and Russia at the same time. And what they came up with was this thing called the Schlieffen Plan. Schlieffen Plan named after this guy named Alfred von Schlieffen, uh, who was one of the, the German's war ministers, who had this idea that um, what we need to do is we need to kind of like take all of our divisions and almost like hurricane style, sweep through, get Russia out or get France out of the war, thinking that Russia is going to be slow to mobilize and then once we've gotten France to capitulate, uh, then we can reinforce the eastern side and then go after Russia. And we need to do it fast because if we don't do it fast, then Britain potentially could put reinforcements on the ground and then we might find ourselves in a long, you know, drawn out war on the Western Front. So the idea was we got to go quick and we've got to make a very, very fast motion that's almost like a circle and then we'll turn and we'll go after Russia. And that's ultimately what played out, except that in order for that plan to work, they were going to have to invade Belgium. Okay? Belgium is a sovereign power, and Belgium has a neutrality pact signed with all of the European powers, and it was signed as early as 1839. Okay? So Germany asked Belgium, <laughs> this is kind of a cool one. Um, so we're going to take all of our ground forces and we're going to invade France, but we're going to need to go through your country to do it. Are you cool with that? And Belgium's like, no, not really. Uh, that's not good at all, actually. It sounds like you're invading us. And Germany's sort of like, well, yeah, we, we kind of are. So that sucks, but we, we want to invade you and we want your permission to do it. And Belgium's like, no, we can't do that. Wrong answer, and then they declared it <laughs> for Belgium. As soon as that happened, that's ultimately what dragged Britain in. Britain was going to be in, it was just, they needed an excuse. Uh, the Britain was in as soon as Germany starts to build up a naval armament that was comparable to Britain's. But what got Britain into the war was eventually the violation of Belgian neutrality. That's what they claimed. Um, so, we're going to talk about World War I in class tomorrow, uh, probably some of Tuesday, and um, I, I guess the, the questions that you have to ask yourself is like, who's really to blame for this? And after World War I, they pretty much said it's Germany. Germany's to blame for the war. Uh, when they put some distance behind it, there's a guy by the name of Sidney Bradshaw Fay, who wrote a paper um, that kind of looked at everybody and what they were doing diplomatically and what role they played in contributing to the outbreak of the war. And his conclusion was eventually that everybody had an opportunity to stop it, but nobody chose to stop it. And that you could look at the Austro-Hungarians and the ultimatum that they put down. You could look at the Russians and how they freely mobilized. You could look, look at the French, you could look at the British. Everybody played a role in ultimately contributing to this decision to go to war. Um, the most profound thing that was said was as the war got started, it came from a British Foreign Secretary named Edward Gray. And Gray says, uh, the lamps have gone out in all of Europe. They shall not be lit, lit again in our lifetime. Meaning he knew that this was not going to be a pretty thing. Everybody else seemed pretty snowed. But Gray was like, this is going to be bad. And God was he right. So... Anyway, the war starts. This is, um, I believe, August of 1914. Uh, it's on, and it's going to start with this Schlieffen plan. So that's kind of where we're going to pick up. Uh, if you're doing reading, chapter 28 of the all, or chapter 29 of the all, is called the First World War. And it will take you through. We're not going to like go into detail on all the battles and everything, but we will cover enough of it so that you can understand the impacts. Um, McKay. Um, the reading in McKay is, let's see, this is chapter 26 of McKay. So the part that covers World War I is starts 
starts on 821 and concludes on 833. So 821 to 833, the Alt Chapter 29, and then sources, there's a full on section there called um, Chapter yeah, chapter 11 is World War I. So uh, we're going to talk about that. That's reading that you can do. It, it doesn't have to be done by tomorrow, obviously, but sometime probably before Wednesday, you're going to want that read. The game plan then looks like we will take this week, we will look at World War I, we're going to look at the Russian Revolution, we're going to look at Versailles. Uh, we'll have a day of review, and then it looks like Monday we'll probably have our test. Okay? Um, Wait, why? Next Monday. Why? I was just wondering. Okay. I mean, is, is there a better day? I don't know. No. I think the original plan was this Thursday, but I don't think we can get the material done in time. So. Would that be like a multiple choice? Though? That'll be the multiple choice, and then we'll do some kind of. You've got two DBQs, so I might make the essay like an out of class, okay. just because there's so much work that you guys have to do over the next couple of weeks. All right. Thank you. Uh, we are